Hello everyone. Uh, if we've not met yet, my name's Mel and I'm one of the congregation members at St Paul's Howell Hill. In fact, for those of you who are from St Paul's, this talk is not in either of our sermon series. It's here because alongside my day job, I'm also a trainee vicar and this talk is going to be part of my assessment for my college. If you've got a Bible in your house, you might want to pause the video at this point and go and grab it so that you can follow along. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 14. Okay, I want to start by imagining a scenario. It's been a very long day. You are tired and have received some very sad and distressing news and that you've had no time to even process the news, let alone come to terms with it. You're really looking forward to getting home and stopping. Perhaps you're thinking about a nice meal or a glass of wine, talking about what happened and being comforted by close friends or family. Maybe you're planning to go for a run to clear your head or sit quietly to contemplate and pray. When you're almost home, though, your phone pings. It's a WhatsApp message explaining that someone is struggling and asking if you can help. What do you do? <clears throat> what should you do? Hold that thought. The Bible passage we're looking at today is a similar story. Uh, let's read it together. We're going to be reading Matthew 14 and we're starting at verse 13. Jesus feeds the 5,000. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. This may be a familiar story to, to some of you. It's one that's often taught in church children's groups or, or sometimes in schools. Today though we're going to think about how it looks a bit different from an adult perspective. Verse 13 begins with the words, when Jesus heard what had happened he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. If you look back to the section before this passage you'll see that Jesus has just heard that his friend John the Baptist has been murdered in very distressing circumstances. This would have been shocking and upsetting to Jesus and to the disciples. And what's more, they may also have been fearful that they were now in even greater danger themselves. Jesus's instinct is understandably to head for somewhere quiet and safe where he can rest, recover and process what has happened. By the way, even though the word used in this section is solitary, from later verses it seems that the disciples were still nearby. Like many of us, Jesus often chooses to have his closest friends nearby, even in the darkest of times. God is his first love, of course, but he knows that human relationships are, are a vital part of healthy living. So he's heading to his recovery place, the, the equivalent of nearly at his front door from our earlier example. Verse 13 continues, hearing of this the crowds followed him on foot from the towns when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. Wow, this is his WhatsApp message ping. He was almost at his point of refuge 
And loads of people have now turned up looking to him for help. It's easy to race past this moment to see what happens next. But just pause for a moment to think how that might have felt. He's full of shock and grief about his friend. He knows he needs and wants some time alone for his mental health and, and possibly also for his physical safety. And now all these people seem to want something from him. And he's got his disciples to consider too. It sounds as if none of them are likely to be in the best state to help anyone anyway. So what's the right thing to do to look after himself and the disciples so that they could recover and help many more people tomorrow? Or should he do what the Bible often tells us to do? Help those in need. There's no mention of Jesus weighing up any of this, although the disciples' suggestions a bit later on suggest they are themselves concerned. And there's not much time to think. After all, the people are right there looking at him. But verse 13 continues. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Had compassion on them. This is a phrase in the Bible that's ascribed to Jesus, to God, to the father of the prodigal son, and also to the Good Samaritan, if you know that story. The Greek translate it as to feel compassion, have pity, to be moved. In dictionaries, it's sometimes paraphrased as love that results in a move to act to help. It's not a matter of weighing up the pros and cons and deciding what to do. It's not thinking about the rules of behaviour or what your duty uh, is and acting accordingly. It's rather something from deep within that almost compels an action. When I was a street pastor near the end of our shift, we became a little irrationally paranoid about newbie team members who would utter the fateful words that it seems quiet tonight, perhaps we'll end our shift early. This was a real head in the hands moment for the more experienced team members. Astonishingly often, a few minutes after this pronouncement, something would happen and we would be presented with someone who desperately needed our help. This would be 3 a.m. at the end of our shift. We were tired, possibly cold and wet, and often presented with problems that, to be honest, could have been avoided. A drunk girl who's argued with her friends and left her cl at the club without her phone, her jacket or her money. A 30 year old who'd come out upset and wound someone else up in such a way that resulted in a punch to the head. Other more sub circumstantial things like those upset due to family illness, bereavement or relationship problems and who'd taken until now to feel ready to talk to us. In our own strength, to be honest, some of us would have wanted to apologise and say, I'm really sorry, we need to head home. I know that I could not have stayed to help out of a sense of duty or commitment. Instead, there was always an inner something that came, something that compelled us to stay and help and never even consider walking away. I wonder if this is as close as we get to the kind of compassion Jesus had for the crowd before him. Something from within that moved him to help them. In 1 John 3, 16 and 17, it says, We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Verse 16 starts by sounding a bit like a, an always help rule that we should follow. But actually verse 17 makes it clear that helping others is something that happens as a result of God's love being inside us. It's almost involuntary. The word used for compassion in this passage is different. Literally, it's love that comes from your intestines. So not a duty, but a deep instinct that moves us to act. So back to our story. What are the consequences of Jesus having compassion here? 
If you took a look back at the verses, you'll see that in verse 14, he heals the sick. In verse 16, he tells the disciples to feed them. Another key moment. I'd love to have seen the exchange of glances between the disciples at this point. In verse 18, Jesus trusts in God and he provides all that is needed and food for the hungry and presumably energy and stamina for Jesus and the disciples. In verse 20, God actually provided more than enough. There were leftovers. In verse 21, the people see the power of Jesus, even though they may not have realised all the details. Surely the healing of the sick and feeding 5,000 people would have been unusual and thought-provoking and a, a story that they were talking about for days afterwards. Jesus must have seemed an unusually generous character at the very least. And actually the disciples who are right there with him, they explicitly see the miraculous power of Jesus. And so it's perhaps not a coincidence that in the very next chapter, Peter has enough faith to walk on water, well for a bit at least, and the disciples declare for the first time that Jesus really is the Son of God. This is the ripple effect of love. God loves us and as a consequence we gain a deep inner compassion for others, which moves us to act, which shows the power of God implicitly or explicitly which increases our faith and the faith of those who are with us, which in turn encourages us to step out, out of our boat or our comfort zone further. How amazing is that? Before we pray, I do just want to offer a small caution. This, this does not mean that it's always you as a Christian that has to act and help. We can sometimes get ourselves in a bit of a, a tangle about that. God knows when it's more important for us to be restored too. Go and read the study of exhausted and despondent Elijah in 1 Kings 19 for an example of that. So whether it's a lot of people on a lakeside or an unexpected WhatsApp asking for help at the end of an exhausting day, the key to knowing whether and how to act is by, about being directed by the love of God that lives within us. If we tune into that, then God will provide, and who knows what ripples may follow. Perhaps that love of God is a new idea to you, or maybe you have been disconnected and want to reorientate and tune into God's love once more. In a moment, we're going to pray, but if you still have unanswered questions and want to find out more, uh, any of the vicars would be really happy to talk with you more. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the immense love you have for each one of us. As John, John reminds us, a love that meant you gave up your life for us. Show us the way to discover you for the first time or to rediscover the power of that love poured into the whole of our life. In a world of great demands and needs, help us to act not from duty or guilt, but to look for that deep intestine level of compassion that you pour into us, so that it's obvious and instinctive when and how we should act. Thank you that we are never travelling through life alone, and that you're always alongside us to provide all that we need to serve and to be restored. In Jesus' name. Amen.